So in this video, I want to talk about the n-type psychotics. Before we start talking about this drug class, we should have a general understanding of what is psychosis and what is schizophrenia. So psychosis in a one-liner is a loss with reality. Your brain tells you things that are not true, and you can't tell the difference. Psychosis is a syndrome. It's not a disorder by itself. It can be associated with many disorders. The most common form of psychosis is schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is characterized by so-called positive symptoms and negative symptoms. The positive symptoms include delusions, auditory hallucinations, disorganized speech, and disorganized behavior. This can be remembered by the four Ds. So delusions are false beliefs. If I tell you I'm the king of China, that's a false belief. Hallucinations are perceiving things that are not there. Auditory hallucinations are therefore hearing voices that are not there. Disorganized speech is easily recognizable because normally when we tell a story, we tell it from A to Z. But if a patient with schizophrenia tells a story, the patient is going to jump around. It's very difficult to follow. And also the patient shows disorganized behavior, just odd behavior. Then in addition to the positive symptoms, so things that we add to somebody's personality, we're also going to see negative symptoms, characteristics that are taken away from somebody's personality. Normally people are social. They want to go out. These people have social withdrawal. They have a flattened effect that means there's no emotions in their face. Normally, you can tell if somebody's happy or not. These people, it's going to be difficult to tell because there's no emotions in the face. Also, they are, show a lack of motivation, so you're not going to get them to do stuff. So the drugs that we're using to treat schizophrenia or psychosis are the antipsychotics, and they are going to be divided up in two generations. First generation, a prototype is haloperidol, and second generation, for example, clozapine, quetiapine, aripiprazole. So number one important thing is that they are all dopamine antagonists. And that kind of makes sense because we know that in psychosis, dopaminergic signaling in the mesolimbic mesocortical pathway is increased. So we're using dopamine antagonists to block that. The second generation antipsychotics have an additional effect. There are also 5-HT2A antagonists, and we're going to get back to this later. The nice thing about antipsychotics is that you can predict all the adverse effects because we know they are dopamine blockers. So we know there are very specific pathways where you find dopaminergic signaling. That's the nigrostriatal pathway, the mesolimbic mesocortical pathway, and the tuberoinfundibular pathway. So if you just think about what happens when we block the dopaminergic signaling, we can figure out what the adverse effects are going to be. So first, let's start. We said that in the mesolimbic mesocortical system, dopaminergic signaling in patients with schizophrenia is increased. That's why we use this drug. So that's our antipsychotic effect. Then we have the nigra striatal pathway, which is important for controlling movements. So if you're going to give a dopamine blocker, you can imagine that there are all kinds of movement problems, all kinds of motor problems. We call them extrapyramidal symptoms. Also, please remember that we have even a disease which is characterized by the loss of dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra. And this is Parkinson's disease. Again, a lot of motor problems. And last, we have the tuberoinfundibular pathway. And what we know there is dopamine blocks prolactin release. Therefore, we can predict if you use a dopamine blocker, we're going to have more prolactin release, which is then hyperprolactinemia, which is characterized by galacturia, so milk flow from the breast, gynecomastia in large breasts in men, and then also all kinds of menstrual problems in women like amenorrhea and also infertility in men. So all kinds of endocrine problems related to prolactin. Then please note that the antipsychotics were not developed as dopamine blockers. They were actually developed as antihistamines. And then they just figured out by chance that they also have antipsychotic effects. So therefore you can predict there's a lot of other effects. So these drugs are pretty dirty, so they also block histamine receptors. So adverse effects are going to be sedation and weight gain.
Anti-muscarinic effects due to muscarinic blockade like dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention, blurred vision, and then also orthostatic hypotension because you block the alpha-1 receptors. So let's talk a little bit more in detail about all these kind of motor problems that you're going to see in a patient that is treated with antipsychotics. So these motor problems are called extrapyramidal symptoms. And we generally distinguish between acute and chronic ones. So the acute ones are going to show up very quickly after you have administered a drug to a patient, like within minutes, hours to days. So what kind of motor problems do we th see? Dystonia, tonia is muscle tone, dys is abnormal muscle tone. So what you normally see is a sustained muscle contraction, mainly in the neck area, so a stiff neck. Then we see acathisia, which is kind of this urge to move. You cannot sit still, you cannot lie still. So it's a very bothersome side effect, often referred as the ants in the pants. And then Parkinsonism. If you see ism, um, this always means resembling a disease, so in that way it's resembling Parkinson. And this completely makes sense, because we said before, I mean, we block dopamine receptors in the nigrostriatal pathway, which leads to these movement problems. And we have even a disease, Parkinson, which is characterized by the loss of dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra. So therefore, you're going to see very Parkinsonian-like symptoms, like bradykinesia, slow movements, rigidity, and tremor. So for the acute extrapyramidal symptoms, we know that this is due to just dopamine blockade. And therefore, we can also do something about it. Because first of all, we know that there is a balance in the substantia nigra between dopamine and acetylcholine. So if you block dopamine, you have a lot of acetylcholine, and that's going to generate all these movement problems. Therefore, how can you help this patient? You can give an anti-muscarinic drug, for example, or you can try to lower the dose. Then in contrast, we're also going to have chronic EPS. And this is going to show up if you have treated a patient for years with an antipsychotic drug. So there's tardive dyskinesia. Tardive means late, and dyskinesia is, again, an abnormal movement. And what you're mainly going to see is involuntary repetitive movements in the orofacial area. So there's something with the lips, or lip smacking, or with the tongue. The tongue comes out and backs in again. That is characteristic for tardive dyskinesia. Why everybody's very worried about tardive dyskinesia is that you can basically not do anything about it. It might be even irreversible. So the underlying mechanism is different to the acute EPS because it turns out that this tardive dyskinesia is probably due to dopamine hypersensitivity. So that means if you have blocked all these dopamine receptors for such a long time, the remainder ones are so super sensitive and they are going to make these problems. So therefore, it's not going to help you to give an anti -muscarinic. It's not going to help you to lower the dose. It would make it even worse. So the last EPS I want to talk about is a very rare form, but very dangerous, can be fatal, is a so-called NMS for neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So back in the days, the antipsychotics were called neuroleptics, and that's where the name comes from. It's not really clear what the underlying mechanism is, but it's referred as an EPS and is characterized by rigidity, fever, and mental status changes. So it sounds a little bit like serotonin syndrome. And in fact, there's a lot of overlap between those two syndromes. So let's just wrap up the antipsychotics and make a little comparison between first and second generation. So we said all of them are dopamine antagonists. The second generation are also 5-HT2A antagonists. They all can have extrapyramidal symptoms as side effects, which is predictable by the dopamine antagonism. But definitely the second generation have less of them. What is the mechanism behind them? So while here the 5-HT2A antagonism might play a role, because it has been found that 5-HT2A receptors are found a lot presynaptically on dopaminergic nerves in the substantia nigra. So what does that mean? So it's thought that if you block these receptors, you're going to release more dopamine out of these neurons. 
Therefore, you kind of counteract the, the effects of the dopamine blockade in the substantia nigra. The important point here is really that these 5-HT2A receptors presynaptically are mainly found in the substantia nigra. And that's the reason why you tickle these dopaminergic neurons a little bit and therefore have less of the EPS side effects. The 5-HG2A antagonism might also play a role, obviously, in the antipsychotic effect, but it's not really clear. So a 5-HG2A antagonist alone would not help you for antipsychotic effects. You need always a dopamine antagonist on board. So unfortunately, the second-generation antipsychotics come with a new problem. And the big problem of the second-generation antipsychotics is metabolic syndrome. The mechanism behind that is not fully understood. So let's just also discuss what they are used for. Obviously, they are used for schizophrenia. And I want to mention that all the antipsychotics are quite equally effective in treating the positive symptoms. And they're actually fairly good with them. However, the negative symptoms are pretty poorly responsive to antipsychotics in general. The first generation basically doesn't have any effect on the negative symptoms. The second generation are supposed to be a little bit better. There's only one second generation antipsychotics that is clearly effective for the negative symptoms. And this is the first um, of the second generation antipsychotics that were, was discovered that's close up in. So now you might ask, why don't I see clozapine more around? Well, the problem is clozapine comes with a big drawback. It can cause agranulocytosis. Although it's rare, it can be fatal because if you are lacking granulocytes, then you're obviously very susceptible to infections and can even die of them. So therefore, clozapine is now only used for refractory cases. So when you have tried at least two other antipsychotics without success then clozapine could be considered. This concludes the video on the antipsychotics.